Am I on? Okay, we're going to try this one more time. And welcome back, Facebook. We're seeing now if they said my voice was too far away, so that means we didn't have it set up correctly. We're testing it now to see if it is working. Actually, that sounds much better. We are working. All right. All right, so let's, let's get into our study. Go to Luke chapter 24. And as I was getting ready to say, we're actually celebrating something of a milestone. This is message number 50 in our series, Who's the Boss? Women and Men in Biblical and Cultural Context. We've been teaching this now for about three years. We've got 50 messages, and we are still just in the Gospels where uh, the New Testament part of our series is concerned. So we're celebrating 50 messages. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 24. I just want to read again something that we've been looking at in our study about the significance of the, of the female disciples of Jesus. Uh, verse 24, uh, excuse me, chapter 24, verse 1 says, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke when he, when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified in the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them, who told these things to the apostles, and their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. All right, now if you look, go over to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, where we have another uh, perspective on the resurrection. John chapter 20, verse 19. It says, Then the same day at evening, beginning the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. Is this one? Yeah, peace be with you. And he said, he said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. Okay, so that's where I'm going to stop. So in our last session, when we were together, uh, we explored in detail the question, were there female apostles in the Jesus movement? And based upon the evidence in the Gospels, we were looking at the Gospels, and based upon the evidence in the Gospel, we answered in the affirmative that yes, Jesus did commission women to be apostles alongside and equally with the male apostles. So this is something we've looked at. You can go back and look at the other messages that we've done thus far. But this is what we've seen based upon the evidence within the Gospels. Jesus also did have female apostles alongside and equal, equally with the male apostles. And as we saw, um, the, the reason for this, we saw that the female disciples actually did fit the criteria laid out in the scriptures for being an apostle. We talked about what that criteria is. Number one, they saw the resurrection, they saw the resurrected Christ. Uh, Peter actually makes this, we didn't cover this the last time, but Peter makes this a criteria for apostleship. Go over to Acts chapter one, Acts chapter one, and we're gonna look at verse number three. Acts chapter one, verse three. And it says, um, we're well, sorry, verse one. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach, until the day in which he was taken up after he, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So notice it says that that he had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, uh, to, to, he, to whom he also presented himself alive. So the so apostles saw the resurrected Christ. Go over to Acts chapter uh, 10, Acts chapter 10, and we're going to look at verse 41. Acts chapter 10 and verse 41. 
So Acts chapter 10, verse 41. Here we have Peter speaking. We start at verse 4. It says, Him God raised up, verse 40, Him God raised up on the third day and showed him openly, not to all people, but to witnesses chosen before by God, even to us who ate and drank with him after he arose from the dead. So again, these are the disciples of Jesus, the apostles who saw him rise from the dead. Go to chapter 13 now. Chapter 13, verse 31. Chapter 13, verse 31. And this is, again, Peter. Uh, we'll start at verse 29. One, verse 29. When they had fulfilled all that was written concerning him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a tomb. Verse 30. But God raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. Now, notice what it says here. Verse 31, he was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are his witnesses to the people. This verse 31 definitely applies to the female disciples. Notice what it says. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to to Jerusalem. They followed him from Galilee to Jerusalem. Look at Matthew chapter 27. Go to Matthew chapter 27. And we're going to look at verse 55. It says, those who followed Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem, they were, uh, they saw him raised from the dead and they are his witnesses to the people. Matthew chapter 27, verse 55. And it says, and many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, were there looking on from afar. Now, at this point, they're at the resurrection. I mean, excuse me, they're at the crucifixion. The crucifixion takes place where? In Jerusalem. So these people have, these women have followed Jesus from Galilee to Jerusalem. So many women who followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, and we know who those are from Luke chapter 8, uh, they were looking on a, from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's son. So these, it says that these women were witnesses. And these, and these women receive apostolic commission along with the male disciples. And we saw this in Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 11, and John chapter 20, verse 19 through 21. We won't go back there, but in previous sessions, we saw these women were there when Jesus said to them, you are my witnesses. And he said to them, as the Father has sent me, I send you. So he commissioned them to be apostolic witnesses or to be apostles. This includes the women as well as the men. So the, when Jesus said in John chapter uh, 20, verse, uh, verse, uh, nine, verse 21, as the Father has sent me, so send I you, uh, G this terminology is used by Jesus in the scripture. This is what we could call uh, apostolic terminology. Okay, look at John chapter 5. Jesus use, utilizes this many times, actually, especially in the book of John. John chapter 5, we're going to look at just a few places. John chapter 5, look at verse 30. Now, somebody is to say, well, the women were there, but how do we know that they were sent as apostles? Because they were there when Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. That is apostolic we're going to talk more about this as we move on, but that's apostolic terminology. In other words, that's what you do when you send someone as your representative, as your, quote, apostle, end quote. In John chapter 5, verse 30, Jesus utilizes this of himself. John 5, verse 30, Jesus said, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. Look at John chapter 6, verse 38. John chapter 6, verse 38. And it says in John 6, 38, Jesus speaking again, he says, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And then one more, John chapter 12 and verse 29. John chapter 12 and verse 29. Jesus here again is speaking. Uh, is it 29? 
it John chapter 12? Yeah, I think I got the wrong verse here. Oh, verse 49. I'm sorry. John chapter 12, verse 49. Verse 49, not 29, 49. Okay, Jesus said, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command what I should say and what I should speak. The Father who sent me me so jesus utilizes this terminology of being sent and what we said before about an apostle is that an, ap an apostle does not go and do their own thing an apostle is a representative of the one who sent them as a matter of fact uh one of the sayings that that came on later on in judaism is that the the man who is sent is as the one who sent him the one who is sent is as the one who sent him. Because an apostle does not do his own will. Apostle, an apostle comes as the representative of another to do their will, to speak their words. So Jesus, when he is saying the Father has sent me, he is literally, he is saying, I'm the apostle of the Father. Now we actually know, we're going to look at it later, in Hebrews chapter 3, Jesus is called the apostle and high priest of our confession. So Jesus was an apostle of the Father. He was sent by the Father. He uses that terminology of himself. He was sent by the Father as a representative of the Father to do the will of the Father. So an apostle is one who sent, who is sent, who speaks and acts as the representative of the one who does the sending. This is what Jesus did. He was the sent one. He was the apostle of the Father. And he, and he did what the father wanted him to do, the will of the father. And this is what Jesus expects of those who he sends out. He said, as the father has sent me, well, how did the father send Jesus out? As his representative to do his will. He says, so I send you. I'm going to, you're going to be, I, I'm the apostle of the father. You are my apostles. You are my sent ones. So here's the thing, by deliberately choosing his female disciples to be the first people to witness his resurrection, Christ, the ideal king, affirms and establishes, and he completes in the New Testament era what God began doing in the First Testament, or what we normally call the Old Testament. Uh, God, be, he began, he fulfilled, and he began, and he was completing what the Father began and what God began, what the Father God began in the Old Testament era after the sin of Adam and Eve. And what, it was, what did God begin doing? He began the lifting and elevating of a female status back to equality with men. Because as we've seen in earlier studies, especially by the first century, the status of women had been very low and it was uh, very low in comparison to men. People had attitudes about women within the first century Greco-Roman world. Jesus, the ideal king, Christ the ideal king, came to elevate women and affirm their status. And with his resurrection, by revealing himself first to female disciples, he completes what the father began doing in the First Testament era. He lifted women back to equality with men, not only ontologically, not only in terms of their being, because one of the things that's often said within complementarian uh, theology and circles, and it's true, uh, but it's limited. They'll say, well, women are equal with men. They have the same value as men do because we're all created in the image of God. So they'll point to Genesis chapter one, verse 26, where it says, let us make man after our image and our likeness. And, uh, and they'll say, see, women have equal value with men. And they mean that uh, ontologically, in terms of your being, in terms of who you are, you have equal value. But in terms of function, they will say, you don't have value. I disagree with that because not only does the image of God refer to your ontology, who you are, it also speaks to what you do. Because women were told with men in Genesis chapter 1, God says, let us make mankind, male and female, after our image and let them have dominion. Them. Together, they had dominion over the earth. So that goes beyond just their ontological uh, value. That also goes to their functional equality. They, they not only have ontological equality in terms of value, they have functional equality that was established by God in Genesis chapter 1. But because of sin, women begin to be downplayed in terms of their functional equality. Okay. Now, the thing that I'm saying is what Jesus did, he restores all of that. He restores their ontological equality. He restores functional equality that women can function in the at same levels of leadership as men. We see this here by the fact that Jesus first deliberately reveals himself 
to women after his resurrection. Okay, this is affirmed by Taryn Williams, who is a, a pastor and a scholar, I believe in Australia. He wrote a book called How God Sees Women, which is this book here. Absolutely wonderful book, highly recommend it. He affirms this also. This is what he said. Let me read to you from his book. This is uh, page 211 from his book, How God Sees w Women, again by uh, author Taryn Williams. Page 211. Is this page 211? Yeah. He says this. Um, Jesus in the Gospels not only uncovers the value of women, but also unleashes the ministry of women. I love that. Let me say that again. Taryn Williams, How God Sees Women, page 211. Jesus in the Gospels not only uncovers the value of women, we've seen that through our studies, but he also unleashes the ministry of women. Then on page 218, he has this to say, which I love this too. This goes along with what, we, what we've talked about. He says, the resurrected Jesus not only gives women the first crucial ministry in the new epic of resurrection reality, he honors them with a new level of equality and potential ministry impact. He says, quote, and he quotes another scholar, Grant Osborne, who wrote a book called Women in Jesus' Ministry. Grant Osborne says, quote, the elevation of women to a ministerial role is a sign of the inbreaking kingdom demonstrating that the old order has ceased and a new set of relationships have begun, has begun. Send that to who? Just send that to John MacArthur. Okay. Somebody in our fellowship said, send that to John MacArthur. So one of the things, and this is what we've been saying, that the resurrection of Jesus created a shift in the cosmos, it created a shift in the world. And I love the saying here again that the resurrected Jesus not only gives women the first crucial ministry in the new epic of resurrection reality, he honors them with a new level of equality and potential ministry impact. The elevation, this is Grant Osborne, he's quoting, the elevation of women to a ministerial role is a sign of the inbreaking kingdom demonstrating that the older, that the old order has ceased where women are subordinate, women are not equal with men, it has ceased and a new set of relationships has begun. He also, Taryn Williams says in the book, that the lesson by, by, revealing, by revealing himself to women first. And let me say again, I keep using the word deliberately because we have to understand, Jesus could have revealed himself to his male disciples first. Jesus and the Father chose not to do that. That is significant that they chose. And we've studied the significance. I won't go into that. Go back, listen to the past two messages. You'll see the significance, why it's significant. But it is highly significant. And as a scholar, we're going to be, listen, uh, uh, I'm going to be quoting from later, N.T. Wright says, it is of incalculable significance that Jesus deliberately reveals himself first to the women, not the men. He reverse, reveals himself to the women. And this is what Taryn Williams says in his book. He said the lesson that he, Jesus, is trying to teach us men right at the launch of the church in the world is this. And I love this. Learn to accept God's word in the mouths of your sisters. Learn to, because if you go back, you read the story. They go, and we talked about this. The women go and tell the men that Jesus has risen from the dead and they don't believe them. They think it's idle talk. And later, Jesus rebukes his disciples for being slow of heart to believe. And Taryn Williams, and I believe he is correct in this, that Jesus is teaching them and us a lesson, which is this. Learn to accept God's word in the mouths of your sisters. Because when Jesus rebukes them for not believing that he had raised, that he had been risen from the dead, he is rebuking them for refusing to accept the message that came from their fellow female disciples. So he is telling them and us, we must accept the word of God coming from the mouths of our sisters. It is of equal, they have equal status, it is of equal importance. It is not of less importance when the word of God is coming from them. And it is not out of order because Jesus sends women first to speak the word of God. He doesn't go to the men first, he goes to the women first. Because see, one of the things in complementarian theology is that, well, here's the order. Men are supposed to be the one to teach. Well, why didn't Jesus reveal himself to the men first? 
Why is it that the first pro proclamation of the resurrection of Christ, he chose it not to happen through men, but through women? So this idea that, well, God has this order and the divine order is that men are supposed to be the ones teaching and, and pre not, you know, uh, not, not women in terms of leading men. Because who, who are the first ones that the women go to? It's the men. It's the men. Now, I know somebody may be saying, well, Mike, what about that scripture in 1 Timothy chapter 2? We're going to get to that. Stay with me. <laughs> it's going to take time, but we're going to get to that. So con contrary to complementarian belief and doctrine, women were apostles and they held senior leadership authority alongside men. However, there are pushbacks and objections to this from a complementarian perspective. So I want to deal in this, starting with this study, I want to start to deal with the pushback, the objections that people have when we say there were female apostles in the Jesus movement. There were female apostles in the early church. So we're going to look at an answer. We're going to respond to the objections and the pushback. Okay. So we're going to deal with one of those tonight because there's several of them and just didn't have time to go through all of them in one session. So we'll deal with several of them. Okay, so the first one I want to explore comes from a Christian YouTuber, and he's a pastor and a Bible teacher, uh, Mike Winger. Uh, he has a YouTube, uh, YouTube channel, uh, over 600,000 subscribers to his YouTube channel. And Mike actually gives pushback against Mary Magdalene being referred to as the apostle to the apostles. So when I first started this series, I said that at times I'm going to be referring to things that Mike says he would be my dialogue partner because while there are things he says at times that are correct, there are also times he says things that I just disagree with and I believe they are incorrect and I'm not the only one. Okay, I've been communicating with other scholars, I've been communicating with other teachers and reviewing their work as they have critiqued what Mike has to say. So, Mike has a critique in his YouTube series, Women in Ministries, especially in part five, where he deals with, it's called Mary, the Apostle, question mark. He critiques the renowned New Testament scholar N.T. Wright. N.T. Wright is one of uh, the most renowned New Testament scholars in the world today, and Mike critiques him. Now, that's not necessarily a problem. Just because someone is a scholar doesn't mean that they are always right, they can be wrong, doesn't mean that they are, they, that they are immune from critique. But I want to look at Mike's critique and see, is his critique of N.T. Wright correct? I'm going to critique his critique, <laughs> okay? All right, so Mike critiques him. And the, and the reason Mike critiques N.T. Wright is because N.T. Wright referred to Mary Magdalene in a speech. He referred to Mary Magdalene in a book and in an article as the apostle to the apostles. Let me read to you. And for those of you that are here, if you look on the back page, I actually have the quote for you. Okay? This is the N.T. Wright quote. You can actually find this on his website. It's also in his book called Surprised by Scripture. There are also YouTube videos where he's reading from his paper that he posted online. But this is the, the part that Mike Winger had problems with. Quote, this is N.T. Wright speaking. We have, we have to comment on how interesting it is that there comes a time in the story talking about in the Gospels, when the disciples all forsake Jesus and run away. And at that point, long before the rehabilitation of Peter and the others, it is the women who first come to the tomb, who are the first to see the risen Jesus, and are the first to be entrusted with the news that he has been raised from the dead. This is of incalculable significance. Mary Magdalene and the others are the apostles to the apostles, end quote. All right, and this is from a uh, speech that he gave called, called, a speech he gave called Women's Service in the Church, the Biblical Basis. All right, so this is within 2024 when he gave this speech and presented this paper. So he says that it is of incalculable significance that these women were entrusted with the news that Jesus had been raised from the dead. They were the first ones. And he said, this is of incalculable significance. Now, actually here, we've studied why that is so significant. We've already looked at that in detail. But he says, Mary Magdalene and the others, the other women, are the apostles to the apostles. Now, as I said before, this is where Mike Winger has some problems. Um, and he rejects this. So let's deal with some of the points of Mike's 
pushback. So I also have here Mike Winger's quote and his rejection, his critique of Dr. Wright. And this is from his um, YouTube channel and his uh, uh, video, Women in Ministry, Part 5. If you want to know where specifically where he's at, is at timestamp uh, 47 minutes in at 29 seconds. I, w I did my research on this. <laughs> okay. I went back and listened to it. And I actually got this because uh, they do transcripts on, on uh, Facebook. So I just went and copied and pasted the transcript. So this is what Mike Winger says. He says, in response to N.T. Wright, after he plays the N.T. Wright video, he says, was Mary an apostle? Were they, and he's talking about the other female disciples, the first apostles? He says, we should not be surprised that Paul calls a woman named Junia an apostle in Romans. And I'm going to talk about this quote, too, because this is, in my opinion, equivocation, which is changing the meaning of words um, partway through an argument. So one of the things that Mike accuses N.T. Wright of is equivocation. We'll talk about that in a moment. He goes on to say, quote, if an apostle is a witness to the resurrection, then definitely there were women apostles like we sh and like there were women apostles like we should all agree on that. But does every witness to the resurrection have the authority of the apostles in this sense? I don't think so. I don't think that there is any reason to believe that that's the case. And so it is. And so it no longer carries the authority it needs to be relevant to the debate. He goes on to say, he says, in making Mary and the others an apostle, N.T. Wright and others, and he means other egalitarian teachers and scholars, they have degraded the meaning of apostle to no longer be relevant to the discussion of women in leadership. So women, um, excuse me, so apostle in the sense of the office, like where Paul claims he can come to Corneth and use his authority as an apostle, like to put things in order, that's more than merely witnessing Jesus. It's a commission as well, and it's not just any commission, right? It's a big deal. I hope you guys can see it. I think that reasonable people can see this pretty clearly. Apostle to the apostles. Then Mike says, that's using the, the two, the word apostle and the word apostles in two very different senses. She's the apostle or messenger to the apostles, authoritative leaders with massive roles of grounding in foundational leadership. Now, this is Mike here defining the words. So he says, when it talks of Mary, she's an apostle or message to the apostles, the authoritative leaders with massive roles of grounding in, found in foundational leadership in the church. These are two very different kinds of apostles. That's it. That's the whole thing for Mary. Mike then goes on to say, now Mary throughout the text of scripture, there's a lot of opportunities to call her an apostle. Mary Magdalene, you could call her an apostle at any point. She's never called that. Never. Not even when she when she's told to go and tell them uh, that, you know, that uh, that, you know, that Christ has risen. Not even then not called an apostle. So just being told to go do something doesn't make you one of the apostles. It just seems so bad, like it just seems so bad, like this is unfortunately uh, the worst argument that ends up persuading the most people because people just don't think clearly about this stuff. They want a mean version, a meme version, and when they get that from certain leaders, they run with it. He says, and they get, and then they get that from certain leaders, and then they run with it. So, Mike's problem is one. N.T. Wright, he accuses Wright of equivocation. Now, what does equivocation mean? As Mike said, it means changing. Uh, he, he accuses Dr. Wright of, equiv of equivocation, of changing and devaluing what the word apostle means. The word equivocation refers to, and I went and looked this up just to make sure I was correct. This is from the Texas State University Department of Philosophy. It says equivocation refers to a key term or phrase in an argument used in an ambiguous way with one meaning in one portion of the argument and then another meaning in another portion of the argument. So it's when you're making an argument and you leave the terms ambiguous and then you change the meanings. Well, why would you do that? Well, the other meaning of, a, of a, to equivocate is to seek to conceal the truth. So in accusing Dr. Wright of equivocation, it's a pretty seri serious accusation. Um, it's the idea that he's deliberately changing words, he's trying to make it ambiguous, he's trying to obscure in order to make a point, which would also mean he's trying to hide the truth, 
or he's not bringing out the truth. That's a pretty, that's a pretty serious accusation to bring to one of the world-renowned scholars. I mean, no one disagrees that, that N.T. Wright is one of the world-renowned scholars. He has many books out there. He's one of my favorite scholars. I've learned a lot from him. So is this what Dr. Wright is doing? Is he equivocating? Is he changing the meaning of apostle? And I would say, no, he is not. The problem is not Dr. Wright, but it is in how Mike Winger is understanding and defining apostle in reference to the 12 apostles and in reference to Mary. The problem is not how Dr. Wright is defining it, it is how Mike is defining it. Now, let me show you what I mean. In regards to Mary Magdalene, he defines N.T. Wright's use of apostle as a messenger. He says, she is the apostle to the apostle. And he goes, Mike says, if you go watch the video, she is the apostle, the messenger. And then in regards to the 12, he defines apostle as, and this is the second use, the authoritative leaders with massive roles of grounding and foundational leadership in the church. Now keep in mind, this is how Mike defines it, not N.T. Wright. N.T. Wright never says these things. This is how Mike defines, and he, this is the two meanings that he gives to it, and then he applies it to N.T. Wright saying, see, this is what these words mean, and N.T. Wright is switching the meanings of the words. I'm saying N.T. Wright does no such thing. First of all, we have to go back and define what exactly is an apostle. And we've talked about this before. An apostle simply means a sent one. That is actually what the word means. Very simple. In its most simplest form, the word means a sent one. One sent on a mission as a representative of another. That's what an apostle is. Thayer's Greek English lexicon says that the word apostle means and refers to one who is sent forth with orders. So an apostle is someone who is sent forth as the representative of another with orders. An apostle is a sent one, okay? The term can be used in regards, especially in the New Testament, it can be, re and, and, and somewhat outside, though they're not quoting the, the New Testament, but in the New Testament, it can be used to refer to four groups of people. Number one, it can be used of Jesus. Go to Hebrews chapter three. Hebrews chapter three, I, I mentioned this earlier. Hebrews chapter 3, look at verse 1. Hebrews 3, 1 says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle, the Greek term is apostolos, uh, consider the apostolos and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus. So here, Jesus is called an apostolos, a sent one. And as we said, he is the sent one of the Father. The Father has sent me. All right, so it's used of Jesus. It can also be used of sent ones of Christ, those who Christ has sent out, what we call apostles. Go to, these would be called apostles of Christ, sent ones of Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13. Now, the reason I'm bringing this out is because when you have someone accuse a major scholar like this and, and to say this scholar is wrong and so therefore women can't be uh, apostles, these objections have to be answered because this impacts women and it impacts the sense of their call. So this is why we're dealing with this. In Hebrews chapter 11, look at, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, it says Paul talks about false Apostle, he says, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into, notice this, apostles of Christ. So here in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse thir 13, Paul is comparing false apostles to apostles, and notice the term, apostles of Christ. These are sent ones of Christ. In other words, those that Jesus, Christ, the Messiah, the ideal king, these are the ones he has sent out. So we have, number one, Christ himself is an apostle, apostle, a sent one. Number two, there are those that Christ sends out as his apostle. And then the, a, a, a third one, it is used of messengers who can be sent out by the church. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And then let's look at verse 23. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 23. Notice it says, If anyone acquires about Titus, 
He is my partner and fellow worker concerning you. Or if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the church, the glory of Christ. The word messengers here is apostolos. They are apostolos, sent ones, apostles. Now notice this though, of the church. This doesn't say they're apostles of Christ. The, and this is one of the reasons, like my New King James translated it as messengers. Anybody else have a different translation? They might read different. Yours says messengers. But the term in Greek is apostolos. These are apostolos, sent ones of the church. So they're not sent out by Christ. They are sent out by the church. The fourth way it can be used, so you can have, it, it speaks of Jesus. Apostolos speaks of Jesus. He's a sent one. There are those he himself sends out. That's the second usage, apostles of Christ. Third usage, apostles or messengers of the church. Fourth usage is that men can send apostles, apostolos. They can send just people, men. Go to Galatians chapter uh, 1. Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. Did you know that there was these many different usages of apostolos? Okay, Galatians chapter 1, and we're going to look at verse 1. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, Paul, now notice this, Paul, an apostle, sent one, but notice this, not from men, nor through men, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Notice, I am an apostle, but not from men. See, human beings could send out an apostle. Kings, in, back in the first century, they could send out an apostle. They could send out someone as their representative. That's an apostle sent by men. So we got four different groups all going by the title Apostolos, okay? There are, there's Jesus, who's an apostle sent by the Father. There is the apostles or sent ones of Christ, the apostles that he sends out. There are the apostolos, apostolos of the church, that the church will send out messengers. Remember, in fact, we're going to look at one of the ways that they will send out messengers. And then there are messengers sent out just by people to represent them, okay? So those, so... Uh, in each of these instances, though, it's the same term, apostles, and it simply means one thing, a sent one. That's all that it means, a sent one in each case. Now, the question is, what are they sent to do? What they are sent to do in each group, uh, what they are sent to do in each of the group that's mentioned, or another way to say it, the task that they are commissioned to do may be different for each group. The word means the same, a sent one, but the task that they are sent to do, the task that they are commissioned to do might be different from one group to the next. Is everybody with me? Is that clear? Okay. So Christ as the sent one, why was Jesus sent? He was sent, number one, he did speak the words of God. He did. He said, my teaching is not mine, but the one who sent me. He taught the will of God, but also he was sent to die on our half on our behalf and to be raised again for our justification as the sent one of God that is what he was sent for then Christ will dispatch his apostles his sent ones to witness of his death and resurrection and they lay the foundation of the church All right churches can dispatch sent ones as those who carry this is one of the things they can do they can carry financial relief to the poor Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're talking about, now notice these tasks, commissions, are different one from another. Look, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. One of the things that those who are sent by the church can do is to send, uh, to collect and or send financial relief to the poor. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, look at verse 23. Again, we just looked at this. Um, it says, if anyone, let's see, uh, same for this one I want to read. Yeah, it said, if anyone inquires about Titus, he is my partner and my fellow worker concerning you. Or if our brethren are inquired about, they are messengers of the churches, the glory of Christ. Now, in context, if you go read this chapter 8 in context, it's about uh, uh, Titus and some of the other brethren who are not mentioned here that who are messengers who are apostles they are going to collect money for the relief of the saints in jerusalem because there is a famine going on this is their commission this is what they're doing and they are trusted and so they usually send them two by two remember we talked about duo duo 
use, and people will send out two by two. If they're going to collect funds, they usually send two people at a time. And so they're going out in order to collect funds for the church to help those that are, are poor and in need. So this is one of the things that the church would send them out for. Okay. So again, Christ sent to die for us. His disciples that he sent, they speak of the, and they witness of the resurrection of Christ and they lay the foundation for the church. Then the church dispatches apostolos, sent ones in order to bring financial, to collect money for the financial relief of the poor. And then, as we said before, men can dispatch sent ones to communicate a message. And we have that in the literature where people are sending out uh, people on their behalf to speak like there's a uh, Lynn Kitson, uh, who's a scholar. She talks about how there was a king who sent out an ambassador, an agent and apostolos on his behalf to speak to uh, administrators within a city. All right. So those are four different tasks, but they all are the task of sent ones. They're just different tasks. So a sent one can have a task that's different from another sent one. One apostle can have a task that's different from another apostle. See, the problem is we tend to think of apostles, we just in instantly think the 12 apostles, and we think the gospel. A lot of words, and this is the thing we have to learn when we're studying the biblical text, a lot of words that we're so used to that for us they're Christian words, they were ordinary words in the first century. Grace, the term grace, caris, that's in the first century, that was not seen as a Christian word. That was just a word that was used in the first century. Paul uses it a lot, and it's been used through the century, and we talk about it a lot in our churches, so that now we think of it as a spiritual word. But in the first century, it was a common word that was used in the day. Same with apostle. Um, an apostle could be used. Uh, it wasn't, what I mean is, it wasn't considered a spiritual word that referred to 12 people that Jesus had chosen. People could use apostolos, as we saw here, they could be used as a messenger, right? So this is the thing we have to get. When we read about apostolos, we tend to think, oh, it's referring to spiritual leaders. Not always. You've got to look at, like for any word, you've got to look at context to determine what's the meaning of the word. So here's the thing I want to say. It is not the task or commission that defines what apostle means. Apostle means a sent one. Now, the word commission means an instruction, command, or duty given to a person or a group of people. So the task or the commission that is given determines what the sent one is to do. Everybody with me? The commission does not define apostle. Apostle means sent one. But the commission defines or lays out what the sent one is supposed to do. Like a, like a missionary, exactly, yeah. So depending on what you are sent to do tells me how you are functioning as a sent one, what type of sent one you are going out as. It is your commission that defines what you are going to do. We know what you are, you are a sent one, but what you're doing specifically as a sent one is determined by the one who sends you. Is everybody following me? Is that clear? Okay, so the task, the commission, does not define every use of the term. Okay, the, the task or the commission for a specific apostle or sent one does not mean, now this is what this word means from now on. The one who does the sending, the one who does, uh, yeah, the one who does the sending determines the task or commission that the apostle or sent one is to do. So let's give you an illustration. Jesus, as an apostle sent from the Father, he came to die for our sins and to be raised again for our justification, right? However, this does not mean that Jesus' apostles or sent one means that they were sent to die for the sins of, human of humanity and be raised from the dead for our justification. That was Jesus' commission. That was not their commission. They are apostles of the apostle, but they don't have the same commission as the, the apostle, Jesus. They have a different commission. They have a different task. Jesus was sent to die and to be raised again for our justification. The apostles he sent out were not sent out to die and be raised again for our justification. They were sent out to speak and witness of his death for our justification and his resurrection for our justification. Clear? Okay? So there, so 
Jesus dying, his commission does not define forever now what apostolos means. It doesn't. Apostle means a sent one. Okay, Jesus is a sent one. What was Jesus commissioned to do? What Jesus as a sent one, what he does is different from what the apostles he sends out do. Okay? So again, uh, apostles that we read where we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, apostles were sent to bring money for the relief of the poor. They were sent to collect it and bring it. But this does not mean that now apostle or this does not mean that now the word apostle means those who bring relief to the poor. Just because we had apostles, apostolos, who went and collected money and brought relief to the poor does not now mean that the word apostolos means, oh, whenever you see it, that means those who bring relief to the poor. Doesn't mean that all the time either. Okay? Each use is determined by the commission given by the one who does the sending. That's what determines not the meaning of apostolos or apostle. It determines what the apostolos is going to do. As a matter of fact, according to the Theological Dictionary of the New Testament, uh, Volume 1, it says that it, when it talks about the word apostolos, it says, quote, uh, the one, it, in terms of the, uh, the, their commission, it says that the one sent should act in accordance with his commission is naturally an unconditional presupposition. In other words, if you're in a, if, if, let's say like Aaron, if, if Aaron becomes my messenger and I send Aaron, let's say to Paula, I send Aaron to Paula with a message. And I say, Aaron, I want you to deliver this message to Paula and I want you to give her this sum of money. He is now my representative. And I, and I say, and I say to Aaron, I want you to say to Paula, this is a gift from the Lord to bless you because you've been a blessing from us. Now, I'm telling Aaron, he's doing that on my behalf, right? Aaron's doing that on my behalf. He does, the, he carries the money to Paula. His commission is to, to do what? Bring her certain money and to speak certain words that I've given him to, to say. It is expected within a first century context that he is going to act in accordance with his commission. Not do anything more or do anything less. He's going to do what he was commissioned to do. Does that make sense? Everybody. Okay, great. So when we look at this again, what we see is um, that a, a, an apostle, what they do, an apostle means sent one, but what they do is determined by the one who sent them. And that can be different depending upon what the task or commission uh, is. Now let's connect this to Mary Magdalene and this whole thing of apostle to the apostles. What did Jesus and the angels who were there, what did they commission Mary and the other female disciples to do? That if you go back and read it, we read it earlier, they said, go and tell my disciples. Now, one of the things that Mike Winger said is this. He said, if an apostle is a witness to the resurrection, then definitely there were women apostles. Um, and he says, we should all agree on that. But does every witness to the resurrection have the authority of the apostles in that sense? Then he goes on to say, um, let's see here. Yeah, and that's the point we're getting to. And the thing that, that Mike, and the question he asks is, well, is everybody who witnesses, does that make them authority? Oh, because he goes on to say that, um, I'm trying to find it here, but you're right, and I'm going to come to that point in just a moment. Um, ah, where is it? Okay, here it is. He says, so now, he says, uh, in making Mary and the other and the others, an apostle, N.T. Wright and others have degraded the meaning of apostle to no longer be re relevant to the discussion of women. And I would say, no, they haven't, because what does apostle mean? A sent one. That is all that apostle means, a sent one. Okay? So technically speaking, if we put N.T. Wright's words back in the, cre in the Greek, he is saying, you are an apostolos to the apostolos. You are a sent one to the sent ones. Now the question we, ask, we have to ask is, what was the commission of Mary and the women to the sent ones? What was their apostolic commission to the other apostles of Jesus? Mike goes on to say, apostle in the sense of office, like where Paul claims he can come to Corneth and use his authority as an apostle, um, he says, like to put things in order, that's more than witnessing. 
uh, that's more than witnessing Jesus. It's a commission as well, and it's not just any commission, right? Now he says, so being an apostle is more than just witnessing, it's a commission. They are given a commission. What's the commission? They, they see the resurrected Lord. They are the first to see the resurrected Lord. And what are they told to do? Go tell the brethren. If you go look at it, it is one, the angel says, go tell your brethren he is risen. And go tell, and then Jesus said, when he sees them, go tell them to meet me in Galilee. Jesus could have done it himself. He chose not to. He could have appeared to them. Later on, he appears to James. Later on, he appears to Cephas. He could have done that. He chose not to. What did he choose to do? He chose to commission the women to give the first proclamation of the resurrection and to give direction to the disciples as to where they are to meet Jesus. They are not only witnessing his resurrection, they are also given a commission by the Messiah, the resurrected Messiah himself. Jesus said, go tell my brethren. He gives them a commission. Okay, so they went as his representatives delivering his message. This is what apostles or sent ones do. They are representatives of the one who sends them. So Mary and the other women were sent ones commissioned by the Lord to deliver a specific message to the disciples. Now, here's the thing. The problem is not that N.T. Wright equivocates or changes the meaning of the terms. The problem, and Aaron, this goes to what you just said, Mike conflates the meaning of apostle with the different tasks and commissions of apostles. He conflates the meaning. Apostle means sent one. This is what they, they were all sent. Jesus does not tell Mary or the other disciples in this instance. He doesn't say to them, I want you to go and establish churches with authoritative, massive roles of grounding and foundational leadership. That is not what he told them to do. They were not being commissioned to that. They were being commissioned, go and tell the brethren. Tell them that he's risen from the dead. Tell them to meet me in Galilee. That was their commission. Okay? So Mary and the other women are commissioned and sent by Jesus and the angels with a specific message to deliver to the 12 sent ones and the other disciples. And they are, Mike Winger asked the question, well, are they really the first apostles? Technically speaking, they are the first ones who are sent to deliver the message of the resurrection. Yes, they are the first apostles of the message of the resurrection. Now, Jesus had called his apostles, the 12, he called them apostles early on in one of the Gospels. We'll look at this probably next week. But in terms of the first apostles who proclaim the resurrection, it is the women who are the first sent ones with the message of the resurrection. Okay? So Mary and the other female apostles, they act in accordance with the commission that is given to them. What's the commission given? Go and tell the disciples he is risen. Go and tell the disciples to meet him in Galilee, which the disciples did not believe any of it. But they are, because Mike asked the question, well, are they really, are, are Mary Magdalene and the women really the first apostles? Yes. They are the first apostles after the resurrection of Jesus, entrusted with the resurrection message, who are sent to go and tell others about the resurrection. They are the first sent ones. They are the first sent ones. Okay? So here's, here's another way of looking at it, because they say, well, are they apostles to the apostles? And this is where I'll close. If we all lived in the first century, let's say we lived in the first century, and you guys are Christians, and I am sent by Caesar Augustus to tell you and the other 12 disciples, I command you by the word of Caesar to stop proclaiming Jesus as king. If Caesar sent me to give you that message, and he authorizes me to give you that message. He even says, I authorize you. If they don't listen, you can throw them in jail. Am I an apostle? Yes. Am I, apostle? Am I an apostle of Christ? No. And I, am I an apostle of the church bringing financial relief? No. Am I apostle of a man, a king? Yes. And what's my commission? To tell you to stop doing something. Are you, let's say you're apostles. So you're apostles. Am I, a, I, am I an apostle to you apostles? And the answer would be yes. I am a sent one by Caesar 
to sent ones who've been sent by Jesus. I'm an apostle to the apostle. Have I changed the meaning of apostle? No, an apostle simply means a sent one. But is my commission, my task different from yours? Yes. And that's where I believe, my, not I believe, he did, he conflates the meaning. He conflates the task of the apostle with the meaning of apostle. And that's not what N.T. Wright does. When he says that Mary and the others are apostles to the apostles, he's simply saying they are sent ones with a specific commission and message who are being sent to the 12 with that message that Jesus and the angels told them to deliver. That's all that it means. It's very clear. Now, so when Mike says people are not thinking clearly about this, I would have to say, I think in his desire to defend the complementarian message, he didn't think clearly about this. There's a difference between the task and the commission and the definition of an apostle or sent one. Okay? So, uh, as I said before, if Caesar sent me to give you a message, uh, what Caesar sent me to do determines the scope of my apostleship and the scope of my authority. Matter of fact, I teach delegation to leaders. And we talk about this all the time. When you delegate, you have to determine what they do and what's the scope of their authority. I teach that in almost every class on delegation that I do. So the same way, when you were sent in the first century, you were given a task and you were given a scope of authority. And so, so it is, if I was sent by Caesar, I would be given a task and scope of authority. It was the same way with every sent one in the church. The one who send you, sends you determines the scope of your apostleship. The one who sends you determines what you do and what authority you have. The title itself does not determine that. An apostle who is sent to, uh, as a messenger of the church is going to be different and have a different level of authority than an apostle of Christ. That makes sense. And, and that's going to be different from an apostle of men. It is what they are commissioned to do that determines the scope of their task, of their task and the scope of their authority. Let me end with this. This is the last word. Mike says, you know, N.T. Wright says they are apostles to the apostles. Well, in truth, N.T. Wright did not coin that phrase. <laughs> he didn't coin the phrase. Apostle to the Apostles, this is from Taryn Williams and Andrew Bartlett. They wrote an article called What Winger, referring to Mike Winger, What Winger Presently Gets Wrong um, About Women Apostles. Okay? And they said, it has been in wide use for more than a thousand years. Among others, the 19th century monk and archbishop Rabanus Morris and the 13th century theologian Thomas Aquinas described her, Mary Magdalene, in this way. So just in closing, it wasn't actually N.T. Wright who came up with that phrase. This phrase has been in use for thousands of years. And it simply refers to the women being commissioned by Jesus with a message. They are being sent to the other sent ones with the message. And the message is the very first revelation and proclamation of the resurrection of Jesus. So in that sense, they are the first apostles after the resurrection. Facebook, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you learned a lot from this. You guys learned something today? <laughs> All right. Facebook, thank you so much again for joining us. Uh, hey, if you like this, we're going to be uploading this to our YouTube channel, KIC TV, KIC TV, uh, keeping it in context TV. If you are watching this on KIC TV, and you like what you're hearing, please subscribe. Um, click on the subscribe button, click on the like button. That helps the algorithm to send out our message to everyone else. And Lord willing, we'll be back next week talking about and exploring more objections to female apostles in the Jesus movement and also bringing our answers and solutions to those objections. So thank you for joining us. God bless you. We'll see you next week. Amen. Aaron, you going to turn this off? Or? <laughs> Bye, everybody. Have a great time. Hope you learned a lot. See you next week.